We're at the end of this book, and today we'll be reading verses uh, 7 through 18 in chapter 4. Verses 7 through 18, we come to, a, a, as typical in Paul's letters, uh, we come to a group of names, and each one of these names were uh, special. They were not just, a, uh, these are not just greetings, personal greetings to those folks in Colossae that were associates in his ministry. Let's read together chapter 4, uh, starting with verse 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your state and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one who, uh, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you, and Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas, touching whom he received commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justus, who are of the circumcision, they only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ saluted you and always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I bear, for I bear him record that he had a great seal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Heliopolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and them must greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, see a cause that it be read also in the church of Laodicea, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. I say unto Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be unto you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you've taken us in a journey through this short but very uh, full epistle. And we're almost at the end. There's still a few things that I think we can glean from the last few verses in this chapter. And one of them is that Paul was not alone. He was not in the work by himself, he had a good group of men and women uh, who became comforters, who became co-laborers, who became encouragers. What would be of us, Lord, if we didn't have brothers and sisters like that around us to move us on, Lord, when difficult times come? And so, Lord, I pray that as we come to the close of this book, that we will remember some things. And tonight we will be looking at a very sad story. We've seen those who uh, stayed and were faithful through thick and thin. They, they continued with the work. They stayed with Paul and labored with Paul in very difficult situations. We, we see how important Epaphras was in all that work because he was one of those who prayed. And he prayed earnestly, he prayed with all his heart, with, with an intensity. But tonight we'll be, we'll be looking at one whose name is only mentioned with no extras, Demas. And we close also with Archippus. Who's this Archippus? These names appear only once or twice in scripture. But it teaches a lot about us. So Lord, I pray that this, this afternoon, we'll be able to glean some principles from here that we will be able to apply not only to our life but to the teamwork that we have in this church. Be with us, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, it's only taken me two services, two, two messages to get to, uh, to mention these, um, the first three names, uh, Aristarchus, John Mark, and Gestus. I put them in the category of those who stayed. They were all very influential in Paul's ministry, 
and they, but they only appear once or twice, maybe three times in the scripture. Those are the, it's like uh, when you see a good movie, you see the, the good act and the, how the, the whole thing comes together, then you, you get to the end, the end and you say, okay, well, those three main actors were so brilliant. Those movies that they make, they're always, they're always a success. And don't realize at the end, all the credits that come rolling down, and every time you get to those credits, what do you do? You get this, uh, the, the remote and you move on to something more interesting, right? And sometimes we're tempted to do the same thing with Paul's letters as we come, come to the end. Uh, these are just names that uh, don't mean anything, but without these individuals, remember this. Without these individuals, Paul would have had it very, very difficult to do his ministry. And I think Paul knows this very well. This is why at the end of practically every epistle, Every letter there he writes, he mentions them by name and gives some detail about how important they were. But in this case, we find Demas and nothing else is said about him. Aristarchus has become one of my heroes of the Bible. John Mark, you might think of him as the one who turned and uh, with difficult times came, but I, I pray that you will get deeper into the story where you will see Mark come up from his um, betrayal, if you will, and come back into ministry where Paul at the end will say, bring Mark, he's very useful to me. And this individual only mentioned here, Jesus or Gestus, uh, hardly we know very little about them. These are all Jews. And of course, we've been looking at Epaphras. Uh, he's uh, probably the one who started the church in in Colossa and probably uh, the other two churches, house churches in Laodicea and Heliopolis. We know quite a lot about Luke and we only have about, I think, three references about Demas. And the, so my outline is very clear. The men who stayed, the men who prayed, but you don't want to be in the category of the men who strayed. Uh, Steve was very uh, effective choosing one of the songs that you know help me Lord when I stray now I also want you to be careful about judging Demas too hard because we don't know the end of the story we do have uh, what happened with, with, with John Mark because Paul writes about him him coming back into the team and getting back to work but we don't know anything about how what happened what was the end of Demas but we do know several things. We have Demas mentioned three times in Paul's letters, and these references are quite encouraging. Two of the references are very encouraging. The end is a very sad story. First, he is called Demas, my fellow laborer, and his link is linked to the good men, uh, Marcus, Aristarchus, and Luke. We see you see that in Philemon, verse 24. These are the men that. Um, uh, Paul carried with him in most of his trips. Demas is included there. And so far in, the, in this, in Paul's travel, he's done well. Paul has no doubts about him. Uh, he's, a, um, he's a fellow laborer. He's laboring together with Paul, and he seems to be doing very, very, seems to be doing it very effectively. The second time, he's just called Demas, and this is where we find him here. And Demas, notice that there's nothing added to him. Luke, we, we see that he's the beloved physician. And Demas, he says hi. No special words of identification. Nothing about condemnation with Demas, but just simply he's here and he says hi. But the third reference is a very sad one because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, later on in Paul's travels, we see that Demas had forsaken me. And the reason why he had um, uh, backslidden was because he started looking outside the ministry, looking at the world, at the attractiveness of the things of the world. He said, it says, having loved these present world. So at one point, remember, Mark also forsake the Apostle Paul, but he was later reclaimed. 
and restored. But Demas, now we find him here, nothing said about him, nothing bad, nothing good, just simply he's going to fill in the space. I think something's going on in his mind. Paul, I wonder, now I'm only speculating, but he's not saying anything about Demas, only he's here just saying, hey, say hi. I'm wondering if he's if already um, considering leaving the Apostle Paul. So what was his sin? What made him depart? It says he loved the present world. Now, I've heard some uh, commentators saying, oh, that's because he was never really saved. I don't know whether if that's true, then none, none of us can be sure about our salvation. Because, who knows, maybe tomorrow you will also uh, uh, stray away. Then we can say the same thing about you. But, well, maybe he was never really saved. He loved the present world. We know there's a lot of churches today with people who still attend church who love the present world. And you can see by what they do. They do very, very little. All they do is go to church, maybe think that that's all they, their responsibility is, and then really do very little in, in, uh, as far as ministry is concerned. What was, wrong, what was happening in the life of Demas? Well, the world enticed him. We find in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, a, a, a warning. Love not the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what he's referring to when he talks about he, he loves the, uh, the, uh, the things of the world. He exhorts us, John exhorts us to also be very careful. Now, if we do fall into temptation, if we do get um, tangled in the things of this world, does that mean that we were never saved? That, what does that mean? Does that mean that we are um, just simply um, being dragged in, we're, we're falling into the devil's trap? Because we don't have any more information about demons, we only know that he departed, he left Paul's ministry. And now remember, most of us, if we followed the Apostle Paul, we would probably think more than once, I don't want to be here. This is just too difficult. Following Paul was dangerous. Mark saw it dangerous. He, did, he felt that, you know, I didn't really sign in for this kind of ministry. This is just too, I just went, I wanted to have an adventure. I wanted to uh, uh, serve the Lord. But then when you see that, uh, the devil comes with his fangs sticking out and, and it, can mean, it can mean death. Then, you know, uh, I wonder how we would respond to a situation like that. Demas was in the same situation. It wasn't easy to follow the Apostle Paul. And he started looking outside of Paul's ministry and he thought, you know, the world seems to be enjoying themselves and look in what situation we're in. And he, and he started to thinking about this and he started attracting him more and more until one day he just didn't have the spiritual um, uh, energy to say, Paul, I'm going to stick with this no matter what happens. No, he came to Paul one afternoon and said, Paul, I can't do this any longer. I wonder how Paul's heart felt. Heartbroken. Knowing what I know about Paul, he probably stood there and sat with Demas and said, Demas, you've been with me all this time. I know it's hard, but I, we, we know that, you know, doing this uh, for the Lord it was going to be hard. There's going to be challenges. There was going to be difficulties. We knew about this. This is not new. Demas probably saw what happened to John Mark. You're going to do the same thing, Demas? I don't know what conversation he had with Demas, but it wouldn't be one that would leave the Apostle Paul with a smile on his, on his face. <clears throat> so we have this very sad story, not sad so far, but later on as we see it in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, we see what uh, Paul says about Demas. He's not with me anymore. He's following the crowd. So we have the men who stayed. Are you one of those? 
and stay not just simply come and sit through the service but come stay and and fought together with the rest of the brothers who are doing ministry those who stay those who understand how difficult it's going to be but we we count with god's uh, um, protection we count with god's approval we identify with christ and his sufferings are we are we that kind of christian when things get tough like Aristarchus, do we stick with those who are fighting? Remember, Aristarchus was one of those who stuck with Paul all the way through from Ephesus, all the way through the voyage to Rome, through that shipwreck, and later on became uh, one of Paul's fellow prisoners voluntarily. I asked one time, how many of you would, if I they put me in jail because of ministry, how many of you would come and uh, spend some time with me in prison? I, I, I think Dorothy said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> I'll bring you a cake. What's that? I said, I'll bring you a cake. I'll bring you a cake. Well, that, make, that will make a difference. <laughs> Those stayed. I would, I would like to be counted with that group. How about you? Well, say, you say, Pastor, I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to go uh, wherever, but... Uh, right now, I don't think I can I can do uh, any of those mission trips. But you know what? I can I can pray, and I can pray earnestly with intensity, uh, laboring in prayer, as we see there in verse twelve. Uh, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, praying that those who stay and those who go into the mission field will stay strong, will be protected. We need prayer warriors in the church. I ended one of the messages with uh, uh, three ladies that I met in Vacaville, California. Very old ladies, but boy, did they impress me. Even 27 years later, I'm still talking about them. They're probably with the Lord today. But the smile, the sneaky smile that they had and what they said about themselves, we are prayer warriors. I looked at them and I thought, they don't look like warriors. But they said, we will pray for you, Brother Perez. You're going to need more than just financial support. You're going to need someone who is effective in knocking on the doors of heaven, coming before the throne of grace. And they said it with experience. And that really, it was their look in their face. One of those penetrating looks with a, an experienced look and say, you, you, you're going to have more than you came to receive. You came for financial support, but boy, you're going to need it once you get to the field. Because it's going to be difficult. Many times I found myself here thinking like, I don't, want to, I, want, I don't want to continue doing this. This is just it's lonely, it's difficult, it's unrewarding. People don't want me here. They didn't receive me with bands and trumpets and drums. No banners when we came to Abin al Madina. And when th things got difficult, I remember those three ladies, and I thought, I hope they sh are still there, lifting me up in their prayers, like uh, Arist uh, like um, Epaphras. I have been around those who've strayed, and they were the most outspoken ones, like Peter. Remember him? Lord, I will be with you no matter what, even now to death. Things got difficult, and they fled. Later on, you see them just wandering, like with an empty look in their face, lost their purpose in life, mingling, hoping that, that maybe they can get a boost by, with a, the next beer that they have in the bar. They strayed. But I've seen some of those who strayed come back, praise the Lord. And some of them that came back, came back very, very strong. Understanding that the world has nothing of value to offer. And then you find the final greetings. But in the final greetings, I thought I'd add a new, uh, uh, one more point. The man who fade. That's kind of obligated. That's kind of forced. But we find a, another name, Archippus. We're going to get to him for, in a minute. But I want you to see... In verse 15, another name, salute the brother which are in Laodicea, and Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. Now, who's Nymphas? 
We know nothing about Nymphas except that he had a church meeting in his house. And you probably know that in the first century that you didn't have, you know, locales or places like this where people would meet or public uh, uh, buildings. They mainly met in house churches. And by the way, not only, not only this church, but the church back in Madrid started in our house, in Arroyo de la Miel, in a street called Senda Perdida, the lost track. <laughs> there was a, the first apartment, the first floor, we opened it up with seven chairs, a, 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 a pulpit that I put together with some wood, uh, pieces of wood that I had uh, laying around. And, uh, and here I was leading the music with these uh, uh, seven of us, and one of them was the gardener. He was so bored, he decided that he'd come and join us. Never paid attention. But we felt excited because we were having our church services in our home. Later on, months later, we were able to get a building. And that building, of course, uh, worked about six months into that building to get it prepared. And today, we, that whole block, the whole building was torn down. A new building was made, and we were allotted the first floor in uh, uh, three, freely constructed. House, uh, private homes used as church meeting places. And this Nymphas is uh, one of those who said, you know, I, I'm probably not a good preacher, I'm probably not a, a good a speaker, but I have, he's like Gages, remember Gages? We find him a couple of times in scripture, you find him in Third John, uh, and John is commending uh, Gaius because, you know, he's opening his, uh, his home to many who are co-operators or co-laborers in ministry. He says, you do well by participating in this ministry. You know, we need more nymphas and more Gaiuses in our churches. When a missionary comes by, don't just leave him to the pastor to give him care, you know, to feed him and to uh, 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 show him, the time. invite him to your home. You know who's going to be more blessed than anybody if you do that? You. I've never known anybody more hospitable than Brother Tim and Kathy. But if I, were, if I were to ask them if that was a lot of work, they would probably say, yeah, it is. But how many blessings did you get out of it, Brother Tim and Kathy? How many blessings did you get out of it? There is a blessing by pr pr uh, bringing forth what you have and say, Lord, use it. Again, I'm not a great preacher. I'm not a great teacher. Uh, I'm not good on the pulpit. I'm not good in front of people. But boy, I can make uh, people comfortable in my place. I want to uh, comfort them. I want to give them the best. I want my house to be a, a, a place of rejoicing, something that will encourage them. I would ask nothing, but I would just want to be there for those um, workers. Later on, when we came to Arroyo de la Mier, guess what we did? When we bought our apartment in front of the station, we opened our living room for services. And it started the same way, seven of us. I have two kids, Maritza and myself, uh, an English lady called Mary, and uh, uh, who was there? Some, somebody else, I can't remember, it was been 27 years. But this is how we, with some folding chairs that we had there, uh, in less than a year we had 21 people in our living room. And we were doing very good, on, except when the elevator broke. Nine floors, uh, having to uh, climb uh, nine floors and then start singing is not a good, it's not a good thing. <laughs> Okay, everybody's excited. <laughs> let's start singing. Uh, I said, no, well, let, let's give five minute break so people can rest. It started that way. One year, uh, while we were working in that house church, we were still working in this building. And this is what's going on in the first century. Although they didn't have official public buildings where they could meet, they still had homes where they could uh, meet for services, private homes. And they used them for, 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 for fellowship. By the way, there's several other uh, verses that gives us the same example. For example, you, you've probably heard of Priscilla and Aquila. 
They were the kind who said, you know, they were, they were good uh, uh, counselors, but they also were the kind of people who said, you know, uh, we have a pretty, pretty big house. We can uh, host uh, services. Uh, what a privilege it would be for you to come to our house and have services. These are two examples in Romans 16, 5 and 1 Corinthians 16, 19. It says, Priscilla and Aquila, in whose home the, the church meets. So Paul's great concern was that the Word of God be read, studied in these churches. I want you to pay attention to verse 16 because we find something here that you might misinterpret. It says, and when this epistle is read among you, remember, they didn't have a uh, a Bible per person. So the idea would be actually what we just did here today. They would read publicly from one copy. They were pretty fortunate if they had one copy. But it wasn't like you go home and read this or maybe uh, each one uh, read a verse. No, it was the, there was public reading, read among you. Uh, it, it, that means to read aloud among the brethren. And so Again, you know, we enjoy it today, the privilege of having not one Bible. I have, I think I have 15 Bibles on my rack, both in Spanish, English, and other languages. We have so many Bibles today, but I wonder if we take advantage of the reading at home. God's Word does not have to be um, edited or changed to meet different problems in various situations. It is always applicable. It is interesting to me that 2,000 years later, we're reading, we're preaching from this book of Colossians, and it's applicable in every verse. Have you seen that? I hope I've come through with this. As we've looked at each one of these passages, I'm thinking, you know, we live in such different times. But you don't have to adapt the scripture to the times. All you have to do is find the principles which are eternal. And we're finding that the principles don't need to be changed because they are eternal. But we come to one more name. Ar Archippus. Have you ever heard that, that name before? How many of you say, well, actually that's probably the first name, first time I ever heard about this individual. He's the kind of guy that started fading away. Many believe that he was uh, the pastor of, of the church in Colossae. Uh, possibly he was the son uh, of Philemon. Uh, this, uh, there's a lot of speculation there. We're not sure. We cannot fully prove this. But it does seem a logical conclusion. That would make Appia the wife of Philemon. And the last words that we find in this book is a salutation to Archippus. And he's Paul saying, and look what he says to Archippus, verse 17, I say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thy will, that thou will fulfill it. Now, how did he know about Archippus? I'm pretty sure it was Epaphras who said, uh, Brother Paul, you know, we left this brother Archippus there, but you know, things are very, very difficult over there in Colossae. Uh, the Gnostics have been uh, giving us a really hard time. The, the syncretists are coming in from every direction. It seems to be a, a constant battle. And Archippus is just finding very, very difficult to continue in the work that he was called to do. And Paul says, well, you know, I, under, I understand that. Uh, I understand how difficult it can be. We don't need to tell him off. Bad boy, our keepers, but we do need to encourage him. Continue doing the work. Don't fade away. Don't give up. Don't throw the towel. Just keep pushing on. Our keepers, uh, you've received a gift, a gift of ministry. Make sure that you will comply all the way to the end. Don't give up. When this letter arrived and Archippus uh, got to hear what Paul said. you think he would be discouraged or encouraged with Paul's words? You know, if I'm going through a very difficult time as a pastor, and uh, maybe I don't say that I want to 
throw the towel when I quit. But I'm thinking about it, and you kind of uh, you come in between yourselves. You know, pastor's not the same as he was last year. He's not ex as excited as he was before. You know, he's kind of fading away. He's kind of his light doesn't shine like he used to. Uh, you might find that in the pastor. What well, what should you do? Or well, what thing you should be praying for him? But another thing, maybe we, you should encourage him. Amen. Paul is doing this. Take heed. Uh, make sure, make sure, uh, uh, that you continue doing the work that you're called to do. We don't know if he's really the pastor of the church. We have good, um, um, I think we have some support to say that he was. But surely he's got a ministry there in Colossa. And he's saying, uh, keep, us, keep, on, keep on with the work. Fulfill your ministry. Make sure you stick with it. Full, fill. Fill it with a full. Don't just give half measures. Make sure you, you give what Christ has equipped you to give. Christ is your full measure. He's the one that can help you come through completely. Fulfill, not half-hearted ministry. I think this is a good passage to preach from for those who kind of been thinking, well, maybe I should kind of leave my, the work that I've been doing for somebody else. I've done it long enough. I've known uh, pastors like that. There was one not too long ago uh, that uh, it said, well, retirement is at 85. I'm sorry, 85. 65, right? And he decided, well, I'm 65, I'm going to retire. And I, I felt like saying, this is not a social work that you do. This is a calling. You still have strength. You still have full mind. You don't re retire from serving the Lord. He did retire. Let the work with somebody else. You know what happened after that? He saw himself still strong and feeling like, what do I do now? He told me one time, I think I'll start a Mexican restaurant. I said, well, you know, I didn't want to comment on that. But I said, why would you want to do that? Because ministry is too is stressful. And a Mexican restaurant is not, you know, uh, there's, something you, there's something you're not catching. Of course, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel called to, to, to tell him these things, but I, I felt, you know, it's obviously a mistake. 65, I'm 67, I'm still young, amen? amen. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> Brother Tim is 71, and he's still he's younger than I am. If you don't believe it, get with him and do a 15-kilometer trek. Don't have Brother Thomas with you, because then he'll kill you. No mercy when Thomas then take, takes you on for a hike. You know, it's not about how, you know, how many years we are, or how old we are. It's, it, it is, in fact, Allow me, it's not really boasting, really, okay? This comes from my wife. I said, you know what, he said, sometimes I think, I'm 67. And people say, you don't look it. And I said, what do you, what do you think? He says, it's the attitude, Sam. It's the attitude that makes you not look 67, makes you, feel, makes you look younger. Amen? <laughs> I don't think you're very convinced about that. But I'll, I'll have you talk to Manitza later on. Now, so here's, here's our, let's get serious. Here's our Kipus. He's human, just like you and I. And he's left with a very difficult work in a very difficult place with very difficult challenges. And he's kind of, you know, feeling very unstable. That's a very human reaction. And when somebody's in that condition, you know what, we, what he needs? It's prayer and encouragement. Imagine Archippus receiving a letter from the Apostle Paul. Paul saying, Archippus, my buddy, keep on with it. Just do it. Just keep on. And not a half measure. Fulfill. Fill it with a full as Christ can fill you full in order to do the work that he's called you to do. So we have this name at the end. But there's one more thing I'd like to catch your attention. Notice that he ends in verse 18, the salutation from my own, uh, my own hand, me, Paul. Now, you'll find this in most of Paul's letters. This is kind of a trademark. 
from the Apostle Paul. The one that I like most is uh, Romans chapter 16, where he takes, you know, a, a, he takes over 20 something verses to give greetings from all these individuals who have been involved in his ministry. Quite a few names mentioned there. And he ends the same way. I kind of trick people with this question. I say, who wrote the book of Romans? And they say, Paul. I said, no. Who wrote the book of Romans? Tetius. I said, okay, come on, Sammy, it was Paul. Paul dictated it. But if you look in Romans chapter 8, 16, I think it's in Romans 4, verse 23, it says, uh, uh, Tertius, who wrote the epistle. Praise the Lord for Tertius. And we don't know if Tertius is the one that's writing this epistle, but Paul says, you know, after the epistle has been written, as, as my manner is, my trademark, I want to write with my own hand, me, Paul, who wrote the epistle, who, who, who brought this across. So he does this constantly. Not only bring the names who have been cooperating with Paul, but now also there's somebody there who is not named. We don't know who wrote the epistle, but Paul says it was somebody there sticking with it who served as a secretary. Praise the Lord for secretaries. Amen? Amen. Where's mine? <laughs> Those people who you know are just there taking notes and doing all the work that nobody ever pays attention to, but it's available because of them. And this is Paul's trademark. We see that again in 2 Thess Thessalonians. Always adds this sentence. Then one more thing. Notice it says, remember my bonds. Can it be with you? Amen. <coughs> remember my bonds. I want you to remember my bonds. Why would it be so important for the for Christians, even today, to remember the bonds in which Paul were, uh, were, uh, were tied to? Well, I think there are several reasons, because those bonds were a reminder of his love for the lost souls, especially the Gentiles. As it says in Ephesians 3, 1, he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the Gentiles. The second reason I think he said, mentions this, Paul's bonds were evidence of his obedience to the Lord and his willingness to pay any price so that the Gentiles might hear the gospel. Praise the Lord for those bonds. In fact, in Philippians, he talks about the bond, his bonds saying, you know, I've been put here in prison. At first I didn't understand why, in chapter 2 I think it is. But now I rejoice in my bonds because it's giving those who are free encouragement. They find it that they find themselves more bold to share the message. I wonder how Paul's prayers sounded like while he, when he was per, first thrown into prison. Lord, I'm more useful out there than, than I am out here. I don't understand what I'm doing. You can bring me out just like you did with Peter, but you have me in these bonds. And then he started hearing other believers who were free talking about how Paul's um, uh, uh, strength, how he gained strength from that and continued sharing the gospel with those around him, his, uh, other prisoners, in the, uh, and even, I'm sure, uh, the soldiers in, those, in, those, uh, uh, in that jail. So the, the believers who were free saying, you know, we are free to share the gospel and we're not doing it because we're afraid. And here's Paul in bonds doing the work. How, how shameful this is for us. And so uh, they gained uh, encouragement by seeing how Paul dealt with those bonds. And in those bonds it says, be careful for nothing, chapter 4. But in all, with thanksgiving, pray. Then later on, honey, so it's unload your worries. And then he says, and just like you've seen me do, think of these things. The good, the, the uh, this, I, can't, I can't say it in, in English, I'm sorry. But all those things, think, those things that you've seen in me and do, do the same thing. And the God of peace will be with you. Unload your burdens. You have the peace of God with you. But then, Fill your mind with those things that pleases God, and the God of peace will be with you. You want both in your life. Paul says, don't forget my bonds. And he doesn't say this with regret. 
it's like a crown for him. He doesn't say anything else. He just ends this, this epistle with grace be with you. Amen. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you. I want another, I want a second Colossians. <laughs> I've enjoyed this so much and um, you know, it's the one that preaches, the one that gets more from the scripture. And I have been encouraged. I've, I've read this epistle in 27, in, in 43 years. Uh, I, I don't know the number of times, but only through it. So by preaching from, from, from it, guess who's benefited more? Right here. So when I go to heaven, I'm going to say to the Lord, Lord, how come you didn't inspire Second Colossians? First Colossians was so good, I wanted more. But then again, you got Ephesians, which is parallel to Colossians. And I've been tempted to preach from Ephesians. I don't know if I'll do that or not. But, you know, I, I want you, but I want to close this epistle by saying th this. Don't neglect anything in Scripture. If you see a verse that's very difficult, try to find parallel verses to see, to see why why the Lord put these things here. Uh, I'm trying to get, become more acquainted with the names that you find here. Archippus. Um, he needed encouragement. Uh, Nymphas. Uh, thank you, brother, for providing your house uh, so that other brothers could meet and be encouraged with the word. And we find Epaphras. Oh, but Epaphras, thank you for praying for me. Uh, your prayers have meant a lot to me. And we find, uh, you know, all the Demas. Well, again, try not to be too hard on Demas. Because we will only know the end when we get to heaven. Really, I mean this. Some would say that Demas maybe was, became an apostate. Well, he, um, I don't know about that. Uh, becoming an apostate would mean to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, not really rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, it's just being magnetized by the, the things of the world, which many times we are also. So, uh, try not to be too hard with Demas. Wait until you get to heaven. You might find that Demas came back and became one of the best evangelists that ever existed because he understood that the world had very little to offer. When you come to Luke, Maybe one day when you get to heaven, you know, I'm going to be one of those who say, thank you, Luke, for having been with Paul from the beginning to the end. You're the kind of individual who doesn't do missions because it's attractive. That doesn't follow a hardworking missionary because he's a nice guy. You've been with Paul all the way to the end. And we come to other names, Aristarchus. Boy, I, would, I really want to meet Aristarchus. I'm, when, I, when, I'm, when I say, hey, Aristarchus, how are you doing? He says, you, first, of all, first of all, you mentioned my name wrong. You pronounced it wrong. <laughs> Second, what you see there is only a very small part of all the things that happened while I was following the Apostle Paul. But I, I want to stretch his hand. Because he's really been an inspiration to me. And all the other names have become, have fallen in love. Tychicus, Onesimus. I wouldn't like to give my grandchildren these names. <laughs> they would be picked at school by all the other kids. But boy, have they become, these names now are in uh, neon lights in my Bible. I've marked each one of them in a very special way because they become very they become part of the family. They're part of they they, they have helped me understand what ministry is all about. The end. I don't want it to be the end. But we've got so much from this. Let's all stand in about 15, 20 minutes we'll be gathering with the Spanish group to have the Lord's Supper. The man who strayed, the man who prayed, the man who stayed, and one who started fading away but came back. Dear Heavenly Father, only you can 
say what category we fit, we fit in. Surely all of us would like to be counted as those who stay no matter what happens, who can be counted on no matter how difficult things become. All of us would, be, would like to be part of those who pray and pray earnestly with all intention, with the heart, with um, make prayer a very important part of their ministry. We need prayer warriors in the church. It's not just about those few who get up on the pulpit and preach. It's those who stand behind, lifting up those who are in the front. I pray, Lord, that you lift more prayer warriors in our, in our congregation. And if there's anyone here who's backslidden, who maybe have strayed in some measure, may we remember, Lord, that if we try to follow the appetites of this world, the things that this world provides, very soon we will be like Solomon, who will say, vanities of vanities, all is vanity under the sun. Without you, Lord, life doesn't really make any sense. So, Lord, may we learn the lesson and not be strayed, not be f found following the pleasures of this world. And there might be one here who feels like he's done enough, that he's done, she's done their share, and that they can now rest, maybe retire. May we remember that we don't retire from being Christian. This is a full-time job all our life. We might retire from a specific type of ministry, but we should always be occupied in some way. <coughs> May we follow the example of those three elderly women that I met so many years ago, who said, we don't have the ability now to teach. We don't have the strength. Many times we are sick. <coughs> Sometimes we can't even come to church because of our aches and pains. But boy, can we pray. We can bring heaven down in order to help those who are on the front line receiving the, uh, the battle blows. Lord, may we be one of these who continue uh, close to you, doing your will. This is not just a letter, Lord, to the Colossians tonight. This is a letter to all of us delivered 2,000 2, years later, but as fresh today as it was when the church in Colossae received it. Help us, Lord, learn and register the truths that we have looked at and live them out. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.